personal prayer requests if you want them. Um, I have a, an aging vehicle that I drive, and I'm not asking you for money or I'm not asking you for a car. I'm just letting you know that, and it'll fit in with the service. You'll see that God leading in direction would be per a participant or actively involved in the process of replacing it, right? You can replace it with a, a sideward move or a downward move. What we want, onward and upward is sort of where we want to be going, onward and upward, not downward. So you can be praying about that. And, uh, you know, that, that God would lead, and what a blessing it is when God does it. Fantastic. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Verse 29, but verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Awesome thought, right? Things to think about. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That doesn't fit in with a lot of people's theology. I mean, uh, what are you out there doing wonderful works and then God saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Like, that's, uh, right? That's kind of weird. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass that when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know, we can get up here and say lots of words. You know, Paul, when he writes, he says, I'm not coming to you with, with eloquent words of men's wisdom. And every day today, whether it's the internet, the television, wherever you're going to have somebody say to you, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you how to solve your problems, or I'm going to show you, and, and they do this seminar, and it's a, whether it's a TED Talk or whatever it is, and you're going to, uh, oh, this is what I need to hear, this is what I need to hear. And really, probably not what you need to hear. It's what he wants you to hear, the guy who's presenting it, because he's making money by doing the presentation. What you really want is what God wants. That's, that's the only thing that ever is going to make a difference in anybody's life. Yes, there are some people who seem to be very successful, but what will the end of it be? Have you read the book? We know what the end of it will be. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's a story in Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to read it. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, Grievously tormented. You ever feel like that? You have a need, a big need. I want you to think about it because um, when you have a need or when you have a situation or when you have something, I want you to think about the process that went into the lives of individuals in the Bible when they had a need. We're going to get back to the story in just a minute, but think about the guys who had a... Uh, a friend who was ill. And they were going to bring him to Jesus, and when they got there, there was no way to get him in. They had him on a stretcher, but there was no way to get him in. And what did they do? They climbed up on the roof of the house, and they tore up the roof of the house, and they lowered him down in there so that they could get him to Jesus. Most often when we have a need, and we believe truly that God answers prayer, but the problem is there's no seeking, there's no effort. We just sort of casually offer up a prayer and, and hope for the best kind of thing. The woman with the issue of blood, she had spent years trying to be healed and spent all of her money seeking after physicians to find a cure. And then, people say, well, she should have started at Jesus. No, she needed the process to get her ready to be open to whatever God would do. We are casually offer prayers and think, oh, I did my part, I prayed. No, probably you didn't because that's not the kind of prayer that moves God. 
It's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. There's no finding without seeking. There just isn't. He that seeketh findeth. So here's the centurion. He's the boss. And he comes to Jesus in Capernaum and he says, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. How cool is that? Jesus said, I'll come. I'll come and heal him. And then the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Have you looked at the guy, the way he handled the situation? There was no, I don't need to show Jesus. I'm not naming, you know, who's out there, the, the general with leprosy. I don't need a big entourage. I don't need a big presentation. I don't need people falling on the floor. I don't need yelling and screaming. I just need you to speak the word. Jesus, I know what it's like. I am a man under authority. When I say this one, go and do it, he goes and does it. So I believe you, if you'll just speak the word. <laughs> just speak the word. And Jesus marveled and said to them, Follow, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed in the selfsame hour. It's not magic. It's not a show. What was it about Jesus that was different? He had authority. The centurion knew what authority was, and he recognized it right away, that Jesus has authority. Now, you'll hear people say, uh, well, I have authority, and I was a child of God. And you'll see them running around telling, I told angels to go and do... Stop telling, you don't have any authority to tell anybody anything. The authority you have is to stand in the word of God. In Matthew 8, 18, it says, And now when Jesus saw the great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart onto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow you whithersoever thou goest. These are those idle words of people that say these great swelling things they're going to do that they are never really going to do. And Jesus says unto him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their Strong word. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And the disciples came to him, and they woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? O ye of little faith, and then he arose, then he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Because he had authority. They just didn't recognize it. They were still in the flesh. All they were thinking about is staying alive and having a full stomach and getting to go places with Jesus. They hadn't got anything yet. Sometimes I think that's where we are. We're, uh, as long as I have something to eat, and as long as you know there's a meeting, I'm going to go to it, or, or whatever. But really, God wants to do amazing stuff. 
But it's not amazing stuff that's going to come with a big show and an entourage. That's, that's just not Jesus' style. There's coming a day when he'll come with an entourage. In Acts 19, 13, we have this story. It says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. <clears throat> I remember when you're first starting out in uh, the church and you go to a meeting and somebody from the front tells you, Oh, this is what you can do, or this is what we should do, or this is whatever, and then you try to go out and do it. Right? I, I adjure you by Jesus that so-and-so preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Pretty profound, right? This evil spirit's willing to say, Jesus, I know. And, and Paul, I know. But who are you? If you have to convince them who you are, you've got a problem. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. It doesn't do you any good to go out and lay hands on your car if you don't really believe it. If you don't really believe it's the plan of God, if you can't stand in faith, you can't, it isn't a formula. You'll see someone say, um, God has spoken to me that I'm supposed to have a new house and then they'll be out there every day marching around it. I'm thinking you didn't really read the scripture even very well because the end result is not positive. I know the children of Israel conquered the land by marching around the city of Jericho, but you know what happened to the city of Jericho? The walls fell down. Do you want a house with walls fall down? But they grabbed onto this thing that they've read somewhere as an incantation almost or a formula for having what they want. First off, it's not about having what you want. That's never a good judgment. It's, God, this is what I think I want, but God, I, you know better than I do. James chapter 1, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Do you count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation? Or do you go, oh God, I must be so far from you, because look how I'm tempted again. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing that this trying of your faith worketh patience. I don't want patience, God. I want what I want. But let patience have their perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, we forget there's other things that need to go with it. If you read in the Bible, and you can read in Romans chapter 12, there's the, the list of gifts given to the members of the body of Christ in Romans 12. It gives a list. In 1 Corinthians 12, it also gives a list of the gifts of the Spirit. Those are things that are, are manifest in the body for the betterment of the body. I always like it. Someone says to me, I have a, a word of knowledge. Okay. And then they speak for four hours. I'm saying that is not a word. That is a book. <laughs> and for a very good reason that it's a word of knowledge because it's not somebody's thoughts. It's a thing that God spoke that is just something you need to say to the person. It means nothing to you. It means everything to them. One time I was doing a funeral for someone I didn't really know. I, I, I didn't know them. I just, I knew, somebody in the family approached me and said, would you do the funeral? And I said, okay, so what am I going to say? So I thought, we're going to be at the grave site, and I, and I want them to remember the significance of this person's life. And what I had done is I had gone around the room and I talked to people. 
and they told me stories. And I took a notepad and I wrote. And so, as I'm standing there, I said, I just want you to think about the dogs. And people started to cry. I don't know what dogs are about. All I know was that the people were love this person and love their dogs so much that by saying the dogs, it meant everything to them. I want you to think about the cottage. I had never been to the cottage. I didn't know what the cottage meant to any of these people, but to them it meant a whole bunch. And so just by speaking a word, it meant nothing to me. It meant everything to them. And afterwards they came up and they said, oh, so great how you tied in all those things about... You see what I'm saying? That's what a word of knowledge is. God knows your need, your need, your need, your need, your need. And so someone who's led by the Spirit of God in that gifting will speak a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. They don't know anything. They're not supposed to know anything. It's God who's speaking to you. It's God who's speaking to you. So in this passage, it goes on and says that if any of you lack wisdom, see, sometimes people think, I'm just going to go through the Bible. I'm just going to... Yeah, we should. That's great. But sometimes, as I will need as I go to buy a car, I will need wisdom. Right? Otherwise, you buy a car that's a car that's a disaster. You know what I'm talking about. You bought a car, sounds good, looks good, runs good, until you get home. <laughs> then it's got problems. And then, of course, nobody wants to fix it. You know? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If you want to reach your neighbor, you need to ask for wisdom. Otherwise, uh, there's a book you can read, it's called The Gospel Blimp. It's about church people's feeble attempts to try to reach their community while the schemes and plans and endeavors that men come up with, marketing campaigns and stuff like that, and how ridiculous it is and how it turns more people off than on to the gospel. Because you need wisdom. What do I say? You probably heard God say it first. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. And then as time unfolds, God will say, now. Now. See, we forget that it's God's kingdom. And the Bible says what? God is willing that none should perish. Did you know that? What is God's will for people? That none should perish. Are people going to perish? They are, because they're going to choose to not go along with God. But God's will is that nobody would perish. And so you're out there. And God wants to use you. And you can be the person who sticks a track in somebody's face down at King James if you want to be. You could be the guy that is really nice at church and everything and then has a nasty attitude to everybody. <clears throat> or you could be the guy that often seems just to be listening, not saying anything until the time is right. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and holdeth it not back, and it shall be given to him, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Get on your knees, get in your prayer closet. God, you know what, what I'm involved in. You know what situations I'm in. You know them. Show me, lead me. Give me your wisdom that I'll know. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. For a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A long time ago, a friend of mine and I got together and we were trying to go into some form of ministry. We were really desirous of being used of God. And I remember I used to live in a subdivision out by Frailton. And um, so we walked around that subdivision and walked and prayed and talked together. And we, walked, we probably walked around it a hundred times. And we'd walk around and we'd say, yes, God's going to do something. And then the other side, oh, no, I don't know. I don't, you know. And there was this wavering back and forth between things until we came to a point where we said, 
Let God confirm his will. God, confirm your will, and we will do it. And he did. And we went out and carried on from that point. But it took that walking around, that journeying around to do that. A couple of friends of mine and I owned a printing company in town. It was called Christian Media Enterprises, and we ran that company for a few years, and it was about, um, you know, we did photo shoots with bands and models, and we um, produced material for different organizations. We published a magazine called Proceed Magazine that we sent out to people like that. But when, in the middle of the night, often, we would get together to make plans for the day, and we would just, I lived downtown at the time, we would just get out onto King Street and Main Street, and we would just walk. And we'd get talking and praying, and we would walk. And I remember we would walk, and we'd walk, and we'd walk till we got to Eastgate Square. And then, well, better not go any farther this direction, let's walk back downtown. We'd walk back, and we'd maybe do that four times in a night while we were out just talking about stuff. We never thought about how far we were walking. It was about the endeavor of seeking God and praying together. And that's how we ran a company. But a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of Lodi rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. You say, well, what are you saying? Well, you know, every week we talk about different things. All, we, basically, we talk around the same kind of stuff, but it's different approaches so that for all of us we get, you know, it's, it's just like... They're, they're conversations I have with God. That's what these sermons are. It's, it's God speaks to me stuff like that, and so I share that with you. And, and God wants us to understand that it's, it's, gifts aren't magic. Gifts are abilities that God gives us as he chooses. And they click with our temperament usually in a, in a way that makes them uniquely uh, usable to God in reaching into the lives of other people. That's why it talks about having a gift of hospitality or having the gift of giving or having the gift of like some of the spiritual gifts, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discernment. Discernment. Are you discerning? Not everything that people say is true. Not everything that people say is real. They may even think it's true and real. Doesn't mean that it is. And so as we're discerning things, that's how we know what to put our trust in is I discern that this is of God. Or I discern that this is not of God. I mean, Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. There's, but you want to be blessed? Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Right? That's what it says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Not not in the counsel of the ungodly. Nor standeth in the way of the sinners. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Do you understand what those things are? Bitterness. Any root of bitterness springing up and thereby many be defiled. Those are the things daily we come before God and we say, God, what that person said, I can't allow it to bring bitterness into my heart. Or that situation or that promotion that passed me by or that conflict. or Because if you will yield to those things, Satan will fill your life with more than you can handle. I want you to understand that. Until you start to learn to deal with those things, he will give you all and more that you can handle. If you're a person who's given to meeting people's needs, even that, unless you're being led by God, Satan will use that. He'll bring you more need than you can handle. He will wear you down by think, making you think you're doing so much good for God, he'll just overload you with other people's needs. And all the while, he'll say, look at all the good stuff I'm doing for God. Did you read at the beginning? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is to the kingdom of heaven. But God, we did this in your name. Yeah, too bad. Because that was what God was calling you to do. And so you didn't help them and he didn't help you. Now, I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm saying that's where discernment comes in. You have to discern. Every, not everybody that knocks on your door, you know, the Bible talks about that. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. It's not the God that yells the loudest. 
Is that the guy that demands the attention? If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly and sensual and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. There's a revelation for you. What can our world? What's it full of? Envying and strife and confusion, bickering. But the wisdom that is from above is pure. That's the first thing. The wisdom from above is pure. Then peaceable. It might be hard, but it's peaceable with your spirit when you hear. It's gentle and easy to be entreated. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. As we walk in these things that we're talking about, it's, they're not rituals, they aren't. It's about walking with God. He wrote a book for us to read it, and then we can see how he led so-and-so, and how, you know, just because God led someone else that way doesn't mean he's leading you that way. He could be, though. He could be. Just because God gave you a gift doesn't mean everything that pops into your head is from God. It's your job to discern that and make sure that what you're sharing as a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge comes from above. Not out of some selfish ambition you have to be accepted as a prophet or a man of wisdom. It's okay to say, you know what, I don't know. We can pray together though and God will show us the path to take. My word is a lamp onto my feet and light onto my path. It's in the seeking that we find. Take the time to seek. You're supposed to be quick to hear and slow to speak. I know it's hard for a lot of us. We love to talk. And that's okay. As long as we're not making it appear like everything we say is from God. Let God do amazing things in our life this week. Let us flow in the gifts and talents and abilities he's given to us. But let us seek his plan and purpose above all things. That in wisdom, we might approach situations. We might receive that pure and peaceable and gentle, merciful, peace and truth and wisdom from above. Let's pray. Father God, it's so great to know that you have a desire to walk with us and use us. And that we can trust you. We don't have to try to work it out. We don't try to make it happen. We can come to you and say, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But God, I'm asking you, show me. Show me through other people. Show me through your written word. Show me in whatever way it takes, you know how to speak to me. You've been trying to do it to me for years and years and years. But let me not be caught up in something that's not fruitful. Or something that's just my selfish desire. God, we pray for the situations happening in our world. As brutal and as evil as so much of it is, in all of that you're at work trying to reach the lives of individuals that they may look to you. Sad to see so many who will not. Help us to be involved in a way that is productive. Speaking the truth in love. 
and we commit our week into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.